Hello, this is Scott Harley, and welcome back to another week of Picker's Corner. And uh, last week we left off, we were talking about bottles, these particular bottles, um, and we left off at a point where I was going to tell you about my uh, special cleaning regiment for the bottles that I found, especially Doug bottles. So as I was saying last week, usually a lot of the times when I find the Doug bottles, they're typically, you know, very dirty, literally half full of dirt sometimes. A lot of times there'll actually be product uh, still inside the bottles, um, or release residue of it at some times, some points. So the first thing to do is you're going to get together what you need. So to start the process, the first thing you're going to need is a nice big, I use like a lobster boiling pot, one of those like granite ware type round with the lid. Whatever you do, it has to have a lid on it. The bigger the pot, the better. Uh, just because of the volume and the amount of bottles you can do all at once. Uh, if you want to do a small batch, that's fine too. Anything, like I said, um, that you can put water in and put a lid on on, on a stove is, uh, is perfect. Even if you want to use one of those big roasting pans, I've tried that before too, like a turkey roaster. Um, kind of hard because it goes over two elements on the stove or two, you know, uh, range on the stove. So trying to keep the heat uh, is a little bit more difficult, but so I use a nice big lobster boiler. So the first thing I do is typically I'll select the amount of bottles I want to try. I'll try to dry fit them in the uh, in the pot to make sure that I can fit, you know, what I'm going to actually start cleaning. Because the first thing you got to do is you got to start the initial clean. So basically, that involves dumping anything that's inside the bottles out. I usually run them under water. Um, a light scrubbing to get off some of just the mud and gunk and debris that might be inside or on the outside. Trying to get it so that when you put them into the bath to actually clean, they're actually, the water will not turn like instantly black. So usually I do that with just like a normal scrub brush or a normal kitchen sponge, the two-sided ones typically with the soft side and the rougher side on the other side. Those are my favorites along with a little dish soap. Usually I don't start introducing dish soap on the pre-clean um, because I just don't want the extra soap in the bath when I actually clean the bottles. So once I rinse these out, usually I'll take the pot and I'll put it next to the sink. I'll put Usually it's like three to four parts water to one part white vinegar. So I'll pour the white vinegar in usually about like 20 to 25% of the way full in the, um, in the pot. Then typically I'll add some cold water. I typically use cold water when I'm doing all the addition to the pot because cold water doesn't seem to have the same concentration of air bubbles in it that you find in hot water when it comes out of a tap. Now bubbles are your enemy. You want water to be filling all the bottles or the mixture with the vinegar to be filling all the bottles. So typically what I'll do is I'll fill the pot about halfway full of water and I'll start just submerging bottles into the pot until I really can't get any more bottles in without leaving air inside the bottle. So typically, you know, I'll lay the bottle in, leaving the opening up so that the air can actually get out of the bottle. Um, a lot of times when I'm orienting the bottles in the pot, I try to leave them with their mouth ends open or pointing up because as we heat the pot, um, air bubbles will form, of course, because of the heat. And so if they can escape, it helps actually get better uh, cleaning on the bottle because there's no air bubbles stopping the cleaning process from taking place. So I get the bot, I get the pot about halfway full now, and now I'll start adding bottles with water in them. So I'll stand there at the sink. I would take a bottle like this, for instance. I'd fill it full of cold water. I'll put my thumb over the top of the bottle. I'll put it over into the into the pot, and I'll actually submerge it into the pot. And once it's actually underwater is when I'll let my thumb off of the bottle so that there's no air being trapped inside the bottles in under, under the water solution. So then I got my pot all full. I move it over to the stove. I'm going to put it on heat. 
I'm going to heat it up till it's just about boiling, a little bit under the boiling point. You don't really want to get it boiling at all. Um, but then you want to try to hold that heat. You want to leave it cooking, per se, on the stove for about four hours. Um, you will get some vinegar smell in your house, so be prepared for that. I typically leave my hood on at least low to try to suck some of the fumes out. It is covered the entire time, but you know some gases do escape while it is cooking there on the stove. So after about four hours go by, give or take, sometimes when the bottles aren't that dirty, if I've gotten them at a place where someone has tried cleaning them before, um, I'll run it for maybe like three hours instead of four. If they're really gross and dirty and have a lot of oil and other matter in and on them, things that are kind of like stuck on there. If it was like beer and there's old beer, 100 year old beer sitting in the bottom of it that's all dried out. Other times there's, I do paint bottles uh, and other oils and weird tonics and stuff like that. So those bottles will have some gunk in them. I'll leave those on for at least four, or maybe five hours. But then once you're done heating it, you're gonna turn it off and you're gonna leave it on the stove overnight. Just let it sit. And uh, amazingly, a lot of times when you come find them in the morning, the water will still be pretty warm. So it'll actually be in a nice warm bath overnight, working off all that gunk that's sitting on the bottles. Now, in the morning, now it's time to actually like do like the, the final clean, the deep clean. So for that, I definitely use some, some tools, uh, bottle washers, you know, they kind of look like they're usually like wire and then they have the bristles sticking out of them. I got a couple different sizes I use to get into different shaped bottles. I also use, as I said before, a sponge, one of the typical kitchen ones, two-sided sponge. And then dish soap I use to actually put on the sponge. Uh, there are some other tools I use. Um, sometimes if the bottles um, have a little bit of staining to them, I find that there are two different things I can use to get the staining off. If it's a metallic staining or a rust stain, um, I find these scouring pads work great. They're stainless steel. They're like little fluffy balls of stainless steel. They don't scratch up the glass at all, but they are great at working that rust stain off. Also, if there's any kind of paint or debris that was splashed onto the outside of the bottles, I find that this takes it off really well and easily as well. So this is something I always keep around, keep handy as a nice little stainless steel, uh, you know, scrubber. And last but not least, the most, one of the most important things um, as far as bottle cleaning is salt. Uh, salt is a great abrasive. So any kind of table salt, I usually go to the grocery store, I buy the cheapest thing on the, on the shelf. And what I'll do is I'll usually start washing my bottles in order of largest to smallest. And I always leave the bottles full of the mixture solution that they were boiled in the night before. I leave them in that solution until I'm actually physically washing that bottle. So allowing the solution to even take more time to just sit there and work at it. You don't want the bottles drying out too much in between working on them and when they were actually in the solution. So once I take them out, I typically would reduce the amount of water or solution in the bottle to about you know, maybe the bottom quarter or so, maybe a little bit less in larger bottles. So once I reduce the amount of water, I'll actually pour salt inside. Now I'm gonna pour enough salt inside so that there's actually a decent amount of salt that actually sits up on the bottom. You want the mixture to be about half salt, half water. And I'll just throw my thumb over the top of the bottle and just start shaking it. So what's happening is the water solution inside with the vinegar and the salt is actually running around, you know, using its abrasive properties to actually clean the inside of the bottle. It's typically the best way to clean a bottle. Um, it's less invasive and less time consuming than trying to take a wire brush and hit all the spots, especially like the corners, uh, the top near the neck where you can't really bend 
something to get to certain spots in here. The salt reaches everything. It's just a matter of time of, you know, shaking it, rolling it around a little bit in your hand, you know, shaking it in a few different motions to get the salt to where you're hitting on the bottle where the staining or uh, dirt still is. So in the interest of recycling and saving money, I would, like I said, start with the largest bottles and work my way down. So what I'll actually do is I'll take the solution that I've actually been abrasing around in this bottle and I'll actually pour it into the next bottle. I'll dump out a bottle, I'll pour it into the next bottle. If the bottle is smaller, I dump out some of the salt, I dump out some of the water solution, and I'll keep going. Yes, there are particles of dirt and debris and stuff that will come off of a bottle and be dumped into the next bottle. It's all just more abrasive material to help clean the, the next bottle, in, in essence. So, you know, shake the next one, move on. So that cleans the inside of the bottles. As I go to clean the outsides, like I said, I'll get the scrubber. I'll kind of just go over it. Um, I also do put dish soap into the, the metal scrubber. It seems to really help grab that rust and pull it off of it. So I'll just scrub the bottles, um, especially around where, like this one had the hasp on it. So typically, this bottle would initially have metal staining um, all the way down, rust staining from this sitting in the ground, basically rotting and rusting away. Um, and as I said, these bottles sit in literally dumps with all kinds of stuff. So Lord knows what's on there and what kinds of stains, but these, uh, this scrubber will definitely help take it off. So that, in essence, is uh, how I clean my bottles and how I think that uh, if you give it a try, it'll, uh, it'll work for you. Moving on. So last week I teased this beautiful bowl here. And the thing about this bowl, as I said last week, it's not something that's vintage or antique. Uh, this bottle was definitely made in the last 20 years or so. You can see it's segmented different wood. I would call this something like a, uh, a console bowl or centerpiece bowl, uh, fruit bowl possibly perhaps, um, with the size and the shape and the relative flat nature of it. Doesn't have a whole lot of like large sides. Um, now this bowl, what makes this thing unique and one of the reasons why I ended up picking it up at uh, an estate sale was the story behind it. Um, so this bowl was actually made by an inmate at the Concord State Prison. Um, and when I found that out, I thought it was very awesome and interesting that, you know, something this beautiful comes out of a place, you know, where people usually don't think of art being something that is um, taught or would come out of. So I did a little research. I found out that the New Hampshire arm of the uh, Furniture Masters Association got together in 1999 um, when the former Supreme Court Justice of the New Hampshire State Supreme Court uh, Kathleen A. McGuire, she invited a furniture master by the name of Terry Moore to come visit the Concord uh, Correctional Facility Hobby Craft Workshop. So from that meeting in 1999 until today, this program, the prison outreach program, has been going on at the Concord State Prison. Now, I looked, I found a bunch of different press releases and clippings uh, as well as information from the Furniture Masters Association website about the program. And it looks like as far back as 2015 at least, there's always been about 12 to 15 participants in the program. And to be part of the program, each inmate needs to have at least one year of exemplary uh, conduct or discipline uh, on their record. And the classes meet weekly and they are still taught by the masters, uh, the New Hampshire 
furniture masters, and it's all on a volunteer basis. And uh, there's currently actually a waiting list to join, which I think is pretty good because you know it's getting some legs and some notoriety. And in the past decade, the program was not only used in Concord, but they also started teaching the program in um, the facility up in Berlin, New Hampshire, and also Maine, their facility in um, Warren, Maine, uh, also has picked up a similar prison outreach pro program for woodworking. Now, the classes are still actually led and the whole program is still led by Terry Moore. Um, he's taken on Tom McLaughlin as his co-leader in it. Um, and the greatest part about the program is as teaching a skill. Now there are inmates who have gotten out and have used the skills they've learned in this class to take up cabinetry jobs, other woodworking jobs. The most, I guess, famous, you'd say, uh, person from the program was a, a former inmate by the name of Donald Briere. He actually was learning how to do similar stuff to this. His, he had mastered um, turning, wood turning, basically, which is how something like this is made. And once he actually got out of prison, he joined the League of New Hampshire Craftsmen, which there's a location on uh, Main Street here in Nashua. And his turned wood uh, segmented bowls actually won him best in show one year at, from, you know, compared with all of the other works from all of the other New Hampshire League of Craftsmen. So it's actually, he's pretty well known and he does some great work. This bowl has a couple little like pencil mark signatures, scribbles on the bottom of it. Uh, not too sure if this is one of actually Donald's bowls or not, because um, it's pretty much unsigned. But um, so these works actually are available for purchase. So you can buy them at the Concord uh, Correctional Facility, actually in their retail showroom. And that's at uh, 312 North State Street in Concord. The Furniture Masters Association also has an exhibition gallery, and that's located in Concord as well at 49 South Main Street. Now, in the exhibition gallery, it's only these pieces of work when the exhibition is the prison outreach program. Uh, the last one I found happened in 2021. Before that, there was one in 2015. Uh, there is no scheduled date I found on the website for when the next one is going to be. Um, but you can always find them at the, uh, the prison. One other thing I found on the Furniture Masters website was that you can actually have pieces um, commissioned. So if you wanted to have a certain type of piece made, there is a process to actually have it commissioned by the inmates at the Concord State Prison. And to do that, you need to contact the Furniture Masters Association in New Hampshire. And they are also always taking donations for the program through their website as well. So if you're interested in you know, finding a piece or at least helping the program to continue, you can do that through their website. There also has been interest and they've been trying to start a similar program for the women's facility in New Hampshire as well. And they said that just before COVID, they were on the cusp of actually like getting the program all together and getting it running. But uh, COVID kind of knocked them back. And at this time, they don't really have any plans to actually get it running. Um, but they are still looking for donations to try to make that happen. So if you're interested in that, you can actually, it says on the website, pretty much earmark the donation you make by the description you put in as to where you'd like it to go and what you'd like to see done with it as well. So a pretty cool piece, not vintage or antique, but a nice piece of local uh, interest for sure. We're going to move on to something that 
I think everybody knows fairly well or sees uh, very constantly out when they're looking around at items in the field. Uh, if you go into any kind of vintage antique store, thrift store, yard sale, um, odds are you will probably find one of these Anheuser-Busch steins. So the history behind these steins was the first one that they actually started coming out with was in 1975. It was a Bud Man. I'm not sure if everybody's familiar with Bud Man. He was popular 70s and 80s. Uh, kind of died out after that, but he was a little round guy with a cape and a mask. The original Stein actually had the top, when you lift it off the top, it was actually the top of his head and it would go back and you know you could drink out of it or what have you. Um, so from that time till about 2008, the Anheuser-Busch company licensed the manufacturer of over 600, I'm thinking more like 700, different steins in that time frame between 75 and 2008. The hardest ones to find are definitely the ones from the early 80s and beyond. This one that I have here in my hands is a 1981. And as you can see, if you look at the bottom of the piece, the only marking on the bottom is that it was a Sarah Marte uh, made piece and that it was made in Brazil. If you find a lot of the newer ones, they'll have more information on the bottom. Sometimes there'll be a little story or anecdote about what the actual scene is on the outside of the mug. A lot of times there'll be a year and a lot of times it'll tell you what kind of collection it's from. So Budweiser did multiple collections. They did some which were unlimited. So they produced Lord knows how many of these. Um, those ones typically always have this, the, the lower value. There were collector series um, and collector club member only steins that were made. The member only steins typically were always numbered and that numbering was typically always on the bottom of the mug. It would typically not say how many the run was of but just what number it was in the run usually stamped in foil on the bottom. Again, the ones that are unlimited have lower values than the ones that are numbered. And again, the, the value is typically associated with the popularity of the subject matter of the piece. Now, back in the early 80s, when they first started making these, there were a lot of variations and if you go on websites there's some that catalog literally every uh, Stein that was ever made with Budweiser's name on or the Anheuser-Busch company. They're all assigned a alphanumeric number which is typically created by the Budweiser company and was typically on the box that the Steins would come in. So once the box was lost typically the numbering for the Stein was also gone, so the internet is a great way to look back and try to find um, what model Stein you have. And then also, a lot of the websites will have the different variations. Um, and the variations are the, typically the ones that people try to collect and the ones that are more sought after and the ones that go for a higher value. So this one here is actually this 1981 mug, I can't remember exactly what CS number it is. I think it's like CS11 or something like that. Um, now this CS11 or whatever it is, it has a lot of different variations. There's variations where the, the background around the horses and around the, the, the buggy and all that, it's all blue. It's a cobalt blue, almost like glass looking enamel that they put around the entire thing. There are other colors where the bottle boxes on the back here are different colors. They'll be all green or all red. This one here is like a red and yellow. And the different variations have different, um, there's different quantities of the different variations. So some variations is very few of, some variations there's more of. I believe that this one is one of the more populous 
variations with the yellow and red, um, but I'd have to look back at the website to tell you exactly. So this one here, I think, has a retail value of around uh, $30. The ones with the blue enamel can be somewhere 75 upwards. But most of the steins that you find these days when you're looking around yard sales and things like that typically have a value between $5 and $25 depending on the subject matter. If it's a limited edition, it'll be higher towards the $25. If it's something like they did series of the, the ships from the Mayflower, the Nina, the Pinta, the Santa Maria. So if you find some of those, those are individually numbered. If you put a set together, you could possibly get a little more for them. If the boxes are included and the certificate of authenticity, of course the value is increased with that as well. But typically, unless you're a collector or trying to resell you know, to a large volume of people, they're typically not the best investment for your money unless you're really into them because there are, like I said, a lot of unlimited prints that were out there. So they did a great deal of volume on these. So they are everywhere and that's why you see them everywhere. That and the fact that they made about 700 different ones. So that looks like all the time we have for today for the most part. I'll give you a little sneak peek of what I brought in that we didn't get to that I'll get to next week. This here is an axe. So this little hatchet axe, this was actually found at a yard sale here in Nashua, right in the downtown area on a Sunday. And uh, after cleaning it up, it looks like it was actually forged here, most likely in Nashua, somewhere between the 1840s and the 1890s. So we'll come back with more of that story next week. Thanks again.